Hi, this is Uncle Matt's d d Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. Today I have with me Josh Beckelheimer, who runs a blog in which he publishes a one-page adventure every month, and um, although he does a bunch of other stuff, uh, since I love talking about the adventure design process, that's kind of what we're going to focus on. Josh, say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. All right, so um, well, first off, just tell us about the blog a little bit. Well, the blog it started, I think, around last year when I got really into Swords and Wizardry. I made a um, just a one-time, like a one little adventure just for me, really. I thought I would just share it to everyone else, and people seemed to like it. Like That blog post got 500 views within like a week, so I thought I would just keep it up. Yeah, whenever you say free on something, you know, you, you get a bunch of people. It, it's oh, yeah, free. they get it no matter what. Even if they don't even look at it, they get it. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of people who just collect this stuff, which, you know, is, is yeah. fine, I think. Um, so uh, talk about that first adventure, and then we'll go into, you know, how it continued to, to move on. I mean, what was the adventure that you first did? The, the first one I did was an idea I had based off of a song by the band Beast Wars. And I just thought it would be a cool little adventure to have. And it was called uh, The Tower of Skulls. And I just, from that title, I just thought of this tower where people um, were like worshiping this god type demon that would collect human skulls. Like they would feast on them. Mm -hmm. And then I just set it up that way and, you know, I wrote out how adventures could be hooked into it and what things you can find in there and just wrote out stats to the humans and the, um, the big demon at the end. So the um, I've always found it real interesting when people go for the uh, the one page adventure format, and I know how useful it is for a lot of people to sort of look at something like that, have the whole thing on one page, you know, get a, a thing from it. Now, when I write, there's no way I could possibly manage to uh, compress something into a single page. How much work does that take to to get it there? Well, it helps that I don't have any maps at all, so that that helps. So I just mainly put in the key NPC stats, like the ones that you must have. And then, of course, the, the GM can create their own stuff. And then I put like um, custom features that you might find within the adventures that the GM can or cannot use. It doesn't matter. But for me, it's just more I have a hard time. You know, okay, this is part one. Let me read what's in number room one. And then we, now we're going to the room 39. Let me read this and see what's in here. I have a hard time going with the structure modules because I feel like I have to know it all before I can run it. So it's very difficult. But with the one page that I make, I have the key information, some stuff that I would like to see in there, and then I just wing it. We'll see what happens. So... um what I'm hearing you say too is kind of something interesting because it it's um, it's an entirely different approach from the way that most people write a module in which the idea is to provide the person using a module with all of the different details that they might need to have. And in fact, what you're talking about uh, is an entirely different lens for viewing the idea of what is a prepared adventure it's a it's a starting off point and an outline i mean is that an accurate view of how you approach it that's yeah that's pretty much it because i i set up the goal of the adventure like this is what's happening this now your players figure out how to get there and how they solve the goal if they even solve it at all so i mean it's more of a it helps with like for people that have anxiety about running games all they need to know is these are the key points We'll just get there how we get there. And so um, that, again, implies a different type of approach to the way that a lot of time people do the, the highly detailed adventures. Because usually in those, from talking with a bunch of people who design them, they don't necessarily think about the thread that's going to get the adventurers there. A lot of the times they're focusing on the location and the various parts 
that are in the location and then their idea generally as a writer um, is to say, you know, hey, the pathway is, you know, utterly up to you. And, that, you know, we're talking about in the design process and in your design process, what you're doing is you're starting with the idea, then thinking through the thread. And instead of providing the every detail that's involved in the location, you're providing the details that are going to get needed along that thread. Yeah. Like, for example, like I have, you know, a lot of modules that I read through, but it's anytime I read through them and like, oh, I would like to run this, I get this anxiety of like, man, I got to know all 88 rooms before I can run this. That's how I feel, which I obviously know that's not true. So if I look at it, like, okay, what is the goal of this module? Okay, it's to stop this. And do I need to get key items in order to stop this? And then I can condense it and then we can take the players and do our own thing with it. It's still the same module, but it may not be the same way the writer wrote it or how the artist drew the maps because it could just go anywhere, but within it's the same storyline. And some of the discussions I've had in, in particular, this was with um, Zach Smith and Guy Fullerton. And both of those two guys talked about the presentation of information to the reader and Zach's point was you can compress an enormous amount of information into an illustration and Guy um, also agreeing with that but he also said hey you know just by cutting down sentence size you can have more information presented and the the, the idea was that when somebody reads a module they sort of see it in blocks of information you know it's you can only see uh, you know, one page at a time or two pages if you've got something, you know, opened out in front of you uh, like this. And so really what you're doing is taking that to, um, I won't really say it's logical conclusion, but it's um, really, really focusing on the idea that someone is going to take the, the idea for an adventure all in one hit and then sort of put that together as a as an inspiration tool of getting it all in that one hit all at once yeah i mean like and also i know that some people they can play maybe for two hours every week while some people may be able to play for eight hours so that's why i set up like the um the location i'll give an estimate like this dungeon might be around three to six levels with maybe 12 rooms per level and that means that GM can look at it and go, okay, I can put this here and here to know like this will fit my group if we want to do it in a one shot rather than feeling like you have this gigantic module. We only play every two hours. It's going to take us forever to get through. You have the main points you need and you can make it as long or as short that you need it. And that's one of the benefits I think with it is you know what's happening. Here are some key th things that, that you need. And here are some fun stuff that you can use and then ideas that you can throw in there to make your own. So here is a, another interesting thing that you pointed out. And um, it is that there are different DMs with different attitudes and approaches because you're talking about somebody um, who just has some an irrational anxiety that I must learn every single room that's in here before I can run the adventure. And I've run into that, run into that too. <clears throat> it was in a slightly different context, but you know, I've often, you know, talked and complained about long read aloud box text. And I, I had somebody, I've told this story before, but I had somebody come in and say, Hey, you know, I really like that because I'm not super creative in the whole visualization thing. And it's real helpful for me uh, to have read along text you know it's it, it it props up a particular weakness that i have as a dm and it sounds like what you've got here is something that whether it's designed to do it or not uh is is a, is addressed to a particular um reading experience by the dm yeah i mean i love those big block texts too i love reading them like i love seeing the details of the rooms but then a lot of those big block texts, there's maybe one thing that you really need to say. Or they're like, oh, okay, we know that the ground is this and this, rather than describing the whole thing. So then you just, I, that's why I put those little features where, say, the ground is covered in some mold and you don't know why. You know, something like that, where, 
okay, that's this room has mold in it, but nothing else does. What could be causing that? Why that's why is that there? Rather than having this huge block test that you have to read and then try to memorize that room 83 has mold in it, and this is why. But with these little features, you can just place that wherever you want, like, oh, okay, it's, it's in this room now. So let me ask you a question. I mean, I know that you probably use these in one particular way, mm -hmm. but do you have, because um, there are really two different ways of running an adventure like that. I mean, you could take it and just have that one page in front of you and be working on it on the fly. Yeah. Or, or you could have somebody who takes it and then writes in an additional level of detail using what you've done sort of as the framework for it. Do you have one or the other of those two approaches in mind while you're writing it? I, I have both because I try to set it up to where, like, for example, someone that loves to draw maps and have maps, I set it to where, like, you know, you have three levels in this tower. There might be six rooms a level. That, so that gives that person an idea, like, okay, I can draw out exactly what this map is. Or then you have someone that does it on the fly who just – just wings it and go, okay, we're in this room now. And he can take them wherever he wants to without av actually having a map. So it doesn't feel like he's constrained to this map. But while others, they love the map and they love having their miniatures out. And that gives the people to be able to sit there and look at the outline and make it their own with their map. They can design the map how they want. And then they can put those features in whatever room they want. And then, of course, add in or subtract whatever they would like. So it's really a um, there's it's a it's a very flexible tool that really does something different than the fully written out module, which is really interesting because it's more it's almost more interactive between the uh, the person writing the adventure, you and the person you know who's reading it. That yeah. is almost a, a cooperative effort between the two of you. Does that does that show up when people comment, you know, on the adventures in the blog, or do you get many comments? I know most people don't get comments on the, free stuff. People just walk main, away quietly. The main comment I get is never really a comment, but a complaint, and it's always, "Why are there no maps?" And I want <laughs> to explain. This is why there are no maps. It's for people, you know, different gaming groups. You know, this is why there's no maps, and people feel like they're constrained to a map make it yourself or you know there's plenty of maps out there just go and find one that you think would be perfect for it and there you go yeah but yeah that's, are, I, that's the only thing i get is just complaints about no maps okay yeah no <laughs> it's it's real common that you know you give something away for free and all that you get is complaints from people so yeah uh, i'm i'm real familiar with that one um yeah and i think that there is a um there's a large number of people out there for whom the map is the hinge and so, you know, like anybody else, they don't extrapolate to the fact that there are also a lot of other people out there for whom the map um, is either not particularly relevant or if they're doing something completely on the fly, that map may actually be a hindrance. What is what is your thought about the, the idea of a map? You, you mentioned that it could be a hindrance. What are, what are your thoughts on that? My, my main concern is like I have really bad anxiety. And then so really looking at those modules, I'm like, man, how am I going to prep for this? There's no way I can sit here and know everything that's in here. And I think with the map, it's like, oh, I was expecting you to go into this door, but you went this door. Hold on, let me go and look. Be like, oh, I'm not prepared for this. I forgot what was in this room. And I like the, I like being able to describe a room, even if it's like, say, the, the characters walk into a room and there's two doors and then they choose the right door. Then I don't have to worry about the left door unless they want to go in it. I can just ignore it. It doesn't matter what was in that door at all. They'll never, they, it wouldn't be like they were missing out on some special treasure or whatever, because it wasn't needed. They didn't go that way. I can place that special treasure wherever they go. And I can place that main villain wherever they go. I can, so it feels like they're making the choices and like I already have it planned out, but really I'm placing it to where it feels comfortable for the story and for the players. And so once again, I mean, this is, this is real interesting looking into the psychology of it, because once again, you're describing something where you think of adventures in terms of a pathway through the, through the adventure and the stuff that they don't go to is completely irrelevant because that, that's not the path that they're following. So, yeah. um, 
and and so that I think comes through into your adventure design um, philosophy, which is which is interesting. I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, if if a lot of other people have that kind of of approach to doing it. Well, like I got the idea mainly from um, you know testing out the, the game Dungeon World. Me and my daughter we played for a bit, and they have someone created this thing which was like a a dungeon starter, and it's like I think two pages. But with Dungeon World, I don't know if you've looked at it or anything. Dungeon World is mainly a communication between the GM and the players. The GM asks a bunch of questions and then uses the answers that the players give. So a GM can even say, you open this door, what's in it? And then the players will give you the answer. And typically it's terrible things that they find because players like to hurt themselves. Yeah, it's, ama <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. We, we, we just had a great... <laughs> In my last gaming session, we just had somebody set off what they knew was a massive bomb inside the dungeon, and then in the, everything else was dealing with the consequences of the massive bomb and what it does. Let me um, now another interesting thing you've mentioned um, is is anxiety because I have I have an anxiety disorder, and um, I was on uh, which doesn't really apply to to playing D anD. I mean, I do, but I was talking with. Um, uh, Stacy Delarfano and um, I said, you know, I'm getting ready for uh, uh, for my game, so now's not a good time to do an interview because I always get sort of hopped up and anxious before a game. And she's like, Yeah, me too. Um, I, and I'm 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 wondering how many, you know, is if that's even a sign of a good DM that you tend to have a little bit of anxiety ahead of time, or if it's uh, just something that's really common, or if there's a particular type of DM that that tends to run into that because you know you and I um, sort of share that attribute. I, I I think about the idea of you know I'm not. Um, comfortable with the idea of coming up with something that someone else has written because I feel like I, I'm going to miss something. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, I would love to run, you know, um, Ravenloft, but I'm like looking at it, I'm like, I'm going to screw this up and I don't want people to know that I'm screwing this up. So I actually thought about seeing how I can condense that into a single page because obviously the main goal is to kill Strahd. That's about it. And so that's the main purpose of that adventure. And then you can just read it and be like, okay, this is a cool feature in this room. I'll put this on my page so then I can use it whenever I feel like I need to. And I think that helps too, because you can, most people read through modules, but very difficult to memorize them and to know where's what's what and prep for them. But it's easy to read it because it's like a book. Yeah. In fact, I said once uh, to some, somebody or other that really, uh, Adventure modules are almost a niche form of fiction in which you uh, you know trace through it rather than following a plot line. You tra you trace through the the location. I know a lot of people who just like to read modules. Oh yeah, because they're great. Because as you're reading them, your imagination is going like, how would I do this in this situation? What would my characters do, or what would my friends' characters do in this room? And it's great to read them. And I think that's why I try to put it in that one page format because I don't really know what's going to happen, how any character is going to react. And they, if they come across a room with poison gas everywhere, every player is different. Every character is different. And so if you have it set to like, this is how this works, it may not go with the other players and how the characters work. So they might hurt themselves badly because, well, in the module, it says this is the only way to stop it, but they're not figuring it out. But if you just make it basic and just this is it, you let the GM discover how it happens, how it gets removed, things like that. I just say, I just say the main detail, like for example, like maybe there's a pit trap on them steps. That's it. That's all I need because I know down these steps there's a pit trap. Right. Nothing else. Now, um, let's talk about some of the other things. I mean, that's probably the central feature um, of your blog. Talk about some of the other things you know that you do in the blog that you're interested in, um, you know, sort of in the in the general blogging community. Um, I, usually, what I do sometimes I, I highlight things, like I'll highlight other blogs or other gaming products that I feel like people should be looking into and and checking out for themselves. Sometimes I'll do reviews or just random whatever that's just gaming. Like, for example, 
when I did the highlight of your uh, Sword of Jordova, that was a huge hit, way huge hit. Yeah, it had people, a. Sorry, go ahead. And, and people loved reading it, I guess, because I had a lot of views, but zero comments. <laughs> yeah, well, lots of views, <laughs> lots of views, and zero comments. Once again, that's that's fairly common. Um, the uh, yeah, and it had a it had a pretty big effect too on the viewership um, of the game. So, I mean, that tells you right there that even though there may not have been a whole lot of comments on the review, a lot of people listened to it and went to go take a look at the thing that you were reviewing. It's one of the real sad things of the internet that there's not um, not that much feedback comes yeah. to people who are doing things. And uh, a, I got a lot of feedback from my one blog post with GM anxiety. I mean, it wasn't on. Oh, I missed that one. Itself. I missed that one. I wish I'd, I wish I'd read yeah. that one. It's, I think it's just maybe two or three posts back, but um, it got a lot of, um, you know, comments on like social media. So, but not on the blog itself, but that was a, a pretty big hit. And it seemed like people were sharing that too. And a lot of people seem to experience the exact same thing. And that's, you know, I explained why I create the one page adventures in that blog post. And some people didn't even know I did it. And they, now we're looking through my um, one page adventures because of that. I think that there is um, a trend. I don't know if it's a huge trend or why it goes on, but I've seen a lot of people start to think about, um, well, in including me with the, the person who had that thing about the read aloud text. A lot of people are starting to think of modules not necessarily as being a standard form of presenting a dungeon anymore. They're starting to view them, I believe, as a communications tool um, for getting some sort of idea across. And so, you know, you are, um, I, I've seen one page dungeon stuff. I mean, Michael Curtis, a long, long time ago, did a whole um, one page dungeon level sort of thing. Um, and I've seen it before, but I don't think I've heard anybody articulate it. Um, the way that you have in terms of it being a tool for a DM who perceives or runs the game differently from the standard format, you know, that yours are a, a, a specific um, communication tool for that. Yeah. Like I even ran my um, one page venture, the uh, siege of Krasmere two different times. And both times it was completely different. Like, because I let the players kind of decide what they were doing before it happened. And then, of course, let the players do what they need to do protecting this town. And it's a completely different game, even with two different groups. And it was kind of fun because I, I didn't know what was going to happen. Like, for example, one, one group, they thought about how they need to go find the priest and see if they can get someone to help with healing and get help the, helping the people which I didn't plan for that. I just picked a building level, which one is the temple? And they, you know, they touched it on the map. I'm like, okay, let's just go there. Then we'll see what's in there. And then from there, I thought of the idea that the main villain is actually working with the priest. They're trying to take over the town because of some item. While the other game was completely different, nothing like that at all. But yet it was the exact same format. I just had that one page, let the players go with it and we'll figure out what happens together. Yeah, no, I think I think that is a um, I, I, what I really like about that is that it's designed for um, the fact that a lot of stuff in play happens on the fly, you know, where the players will do something that you don't expect. There, there would certainly be some people who would, you know, say, oh, it's not old school because you're not defining the challenges and then letting the players uh run into the challenges, you know, sort of as they are in the world that is created. But at the same time, I think you've got a lot of people who would um, say that old school is, is, is definitely all about um, enabling the DM to work on the fly. You know, that one of the things that the older school systems allow um, is much, much more flexibility in terms of just running with it. And I think that um, that's one of those artificial arguments that get started on the uh, 
on the net where you've got you know those two different groups seeing yeah. it uh, seeing it as a dichotomy and maybe not realizing that um these are just two different approaches to running an adventure yeah i mean and, and especially if you take that adventure and wrote it as a you know like a true module that means you have to write it be like okay the priest is working with this person but then you have to also write how now we got to somehow get the players to interact with this priest somehow so that they know that he's working with the villain. And it's just hard to, when you look at it, like, okay, well now we got this huge town. How am I supposed to get these players all the way to the temple if they're just focusing on what's happening outside the walls? And they'll never know what's going behind the scenes if, if, if you're going by a real structure of, okay, this building has this going on. I got to get the people in there somehow, but they, they are refusing to go. And with that, you know, you don't, it eliminates that. You can put that wherever you want. That priest could have just ran right by them and be like, hey, and like, oh, I can help you. And then you find out the priest is working with the, the enemy somehow. It's easier that way, I think. That's how I view it in ways. Anybody who wants anybody who wants to view this as being a uh, fundamental debate should go and look at Courtney Campbell's blog post about the quantum ogre, um, which happens to take the other uh, viewpoint uh, on this. And I'm not taking a side one way or the other um, in it, but it's it's interesting because you you're um, you're establishing a a, a premise premise and a method of gaming um that courtney talks about the other side on it so for those viewers who are out there obviously i can't remember courtney's um exactly how to to get there with people but the quantum ogre is something you would want to look at um if you want to see um the reverse viewpoint of how to run an adventure so um anyway with that with that little aside um uh i i think that uh one of the interesting things you're describing there is something that I run into a lot, which is trying to plan for the um, for the information flow that has to go to the uh, to the players. Um, I mean, it's to the characters as well. But if there are if there's more than one step to discovering something, or if there is more than one way to approach some sort of final goal. Um, it can be, um, one thing I did, I think it was in Rogues of Rambala, was simply jot down lots of different little pieces of information that people could get um, in different places if they asked around. And so based on where they asked around, they might have a completely different set of, um, you know, just one line little factoids, some of which were very helpful, some of which were not particularly helpful. Um, yeah. And I think that's important. I mean, like I said, I, as a player, I don't mind how the GM runs. I'm playing the game. I mean, they can go, you know, page by page in the modules. That's fine. But like with my running style, I can't do it that way. And I like oh, both. Yeah. I, totally, I, mean, I totally hear you. I totally hear I mean, you. I, mean, I like both because there's, it's the same because it, it's still a different story. So I love the whole, I would love to play in Ravenloft just to be able to, to know exactly how that goes. But then I'll be like, well, let me see if I could take this to one page and see what happens in my version of it. Well, really, and, and the other thing, you know, just like you say there, I mean, every DM's version of Ravenloft or Keep on the Borderlands, you know, or any of the things that lots of people have played, uh, every one of those versions is legitimate. Yeah. You know, that's that's the real Ravenloft for that group. That's the real keep on the borderlands for that group. And it doesn't matter uh, what sort of embellishments uh, you may have thrown in there or, or what sort of, um, you know, crappy encounters you may have thrown out because you, you didn't feel like doing it. And so, you know, uh, an approach to Ravenloft, even if it was done, uh, you know, from that sort of one page format that you're talking about, it's still Ravenloft. In fact, that would be the pro that would be the project would be to get real Ravenloft into the one page. Oh yeah. That, that's what's difficult is looking at these modules and be like, how can I condense this into something that I can know the facts or some cool features that I would like to put in there without missing anything. That's really important. And it's difficult, especially that's why I cannot do any newer games just because the stat blocks themselves take up over the entire page. Like five, uh, including, 
including stat blocks is something that a lot of people skip when they're trying to do that whole yeah uh, one page. I think adventure. it's good because like I need it for this villain because I just wrote it out. I'm not going to remember this guy's stat blocks, but then I'll also like the other ones I'll reference, you know, like the book, like Sword and Wizardry book complete or the light, like it's in here. So if you have a company that, that stat is in there for you. So that's why I only put in the stuff that I create or just newer things. So you yeah, have everything those. else you're just repeating. Yeah. And most people, if you play a lot, you know, like the goblin, you know, you know, they're hit, hit and die and everything else. Yeah. But like the newer monsters, obviously you got to have that stat block right there because you're not going to know what it is. Okay, now I'm running out of um, questions about one-page adventures, and we talked a little bit about the other things that um, you do on your blog between the, the reviews um, and the commentaries and the, the thing on um, gaming with anxiety, which I really i am interested in going and reading. That's going to be my next thing. But um, what other thoughts do you have um that you might want to throw out there or talk about uh honestly i don't know <laughs> yeah that's a that's a that's a really sucky question to ask because normally <laughs> normally it's me <clears throat> excuse me it's me throwing out the uh the questions and that's sort of my job uh to actually <laughs> be the one who thinks about the uh the questions but you know obviously as a as a blogger you're out there and you read stuff so comment on conventions uh they uh conventions they they terrify me but at the same time they're great <laughs> do you go do you go to any um there's like a small one here but i with all the people it's very difficult for me to just be I, around so many people <laughs> yeah i don't i'm not a big fan of crowds and uh you know, when I'm at a convention, I, I tend to be found, you know, either in the smoking area with a few people often I've seen them many times before, you know, or I'll disappear behind our, uh, you know, booth and be talking to people. Something about having a table full of books in front of you when you're talking to people is it makes things, uh, a lot easier too. And then, you know, hanging out, uh, you know, a lot of time with, with industry view, I, I never go out and be like, you know, hi, I'm Matt Finch come and Ask me to sign stuff. For, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I could not do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not so bad, you know, on a small scale. You know, one person catches you and, and, and starts, you know, talking about stuff. That's great. It's just when there are, uh, you know, people waiting. That that one really throws me is when you're talking to one person and there's somebody else waiting to talk to you. You just go, what, what is the social convention in this situation? I have no idea whether I'm supposed to, you know, try and include both of these people or whether the thing yeah. is that this guy's got my time and I'm focusing on it. You know, what is, I don't know what good manners are in this situation. Yeah, I, I cannot do that. I don't know when to stop talking to this person, acknowledge that person. It's terrible. I guess I try to avoid all situations like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was real fortunate that, you know, because I had not been to a convention oh, for decades. In fact, I think the last convention I had been to was one where I got grounded for coming in uh, so late. Hang on a second. So was my mom. All right. So <laughs> that's going to be the second big editing chunk on here. Um, shit. What was I talking about, too? We were talking about conventions and we were talking about dealing with people at conventions. Uh, shit, do you remember? <laughs> Something about... I don't even know. <laughs> uh -oh. No, we were rolling there. It was... Uh... Oh, well, anyway. Okay, all right, I got one. I got, I got a way of getting back into it. Okay, here we go. Okay. So one of the things I really like on the on the topic of conventions, I hadn't been to one um, for like decades and I got in it like so long ago that I got grounded for coming home too late. And um, that was OwlCon, by the way, here in Houston. And um, uh, and then as an adult, I got invited to North Texas uh, RPG Con, which at that point it was like their first one. And there was only 50 people. And I was like, OK, 50 people. I can do that. And um, so went to that. And then, of course, the convention has grown. But I guess since I sort of grew 
with it, you know, I saw it incrementally going up every year. So it's kind of like, you know, how do you boil a frog? You just put them in water and heat up the water and they don't get out. And so I guess that sort of ev evaporated some of the, the anxiety that it was only getting bigger a little bit per year. But the small cons are nice. Yeah, that would, I mean, I could do that where you go in it's small and then it grows as you go, but you're already comfortable because you already have some key people there that you know, that you can well, kind of latch on to that, you know, like they're always here. I can latch onto them. I'm good. Well, I think that's a big deal. I mean, because the other thing is that, you know, when I go to uh, conventions, you know, I know lots and lots of the people, even, even if it's a convention I haven't been to, uh, you know, John Hirschberger and Alan Grow are likely to be there. And, you know, Bill Webb is probably going to be there and Skeeter is probably going to show up and, um, you know, Jeff Tulaney. And, and so just, the, you know, the people that I know, um, you know, who's, who pub happen to publish stuff, generally some of those are going to be at pretty much any convention uh, yeah. that I go to some, some mix of them, you know, so that there's somebody uh, that I know. And that's, I think that's really the, I, don't, I, I think for a lot of people, certainly for me, it's just the issue of, I, you know, I'm not super big on meeting new people. I like to do that, you know, very little bit at a time. And so oh, it's, yeah. you know, but it's, it's real nice to have people that you've seen them before. And then you, you know, in that, in that group, it's easy to meet one more person here. One more oh, person exactly. Here. Like one, one a year is all I need. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I limited myself for a long time to just the one convention. And um, uh, cause I've, cause I've got a funny one um, with my anxiety disorder. I, I got no problem getting on a plane, flying, turbulence, doesn't matter at all. I'm scared of airports though. <laughs> I don't like, parking in airports i don't like security in airports because god knows what security is going to do they're going to decide that i fit some sort of profile and then i'm going to be late for my flight and all kinds of disasters are going to happen i i'm the only person i know who gets on the plane and goes oh thank god that's done with. <laughs> <laughs> well you got that comfort it's like you're in that little bubble there and you're fine yeah it shows you how it shows you how irrational the anxiety disorder stuff is you know it's uh um but there's just no way around it. You know, air, airports suck for me. Getting on the plane is the point where I'm, you know, finally relieved. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. But what's fact, I can handle fares just because I guess I'm in my bubble and I'm focused on what I'm doing and not everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. Renaissance festival is totally different from a convention. Utterly different yeah. animal. No oh, yeah. idea. Like, I no idea that. why. I can do that. Fine. But everything else, it's like, ugh. Yeah. I, don't know, I guess it's like you're forced to see people. You're forced to say hello. You're forced to have a conversation with people. But yeah. when you go to those, no one knows you. No one cares. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the funny thing is, you know, I absolutely love meeting people at cons. I love gamers. They're fascinating. Um, you know, the most interesting people in the world are gamers at a convention. It's just that, you know, the, it's the, it's the social bit about, you know, hi, how you doing? Pleased to meet you. God, I hope I remember your name later. But then when you get talking to them, you know, it's, it's the best thing in the world. I really love that. But, uh, uh, boy, it does, it does have, you know, every single person, there's a momentary leap of, you know. Oh yeah. You know, and I'm terrible with names. You can tell me your name. I forgot the moment you told me. I'm terrible yeah. with it. I'm Matt Finch. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that name. <laughs> yeah, I tell I tell people they're going to have to remind me about their name like two or three times. People are actually really good about that. They uh, uh, they don't have a problem with that. But um, okay, so to wrap up, I think we covered a bunch of really interesting ideas here. One of them being how the uh, uh, the one page thing hits you all at once. One of them being the fact that the one page dungeon can be used in a, um, in a different way, um, either by DMs who have um, some anxiety about the idea of filling out a whole module. It's the fact that it can be used for on the fly gaming. Um, it, uh, we talked about the, uh, the pathway through it and how that's one way of, of looking at things. We talked a little bit about the idea that, um, you know, you can you can use only what you need. Um, so uh, I, I appreciate all of the all of the interesting ideas that that you raised here. Well, thank you. So let's go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, Josh, say goodbye to all of those people out there who do download your stuff but don't comment. <laughs> goodbye.
And, uh, five, six people. <laughs> <laughs> 500, 500 hits on your thing. You're talking to 500 people out there, but they won't say anything in the comments under the video, though. So, nah, all right. So, everybody, no matter what uh, type of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.